Please join me in giving a warm Georgia Tech welcome to our speaker, Philip Martin. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, you hear yourself introduced and you go, wow, who is that guy? Um, well, you know, I want to have a little bit of uh, informal fun here today. I get a chance occasionally to address audiences like yourselves, and I, I actually look forward to it very much. So what I'd like to do today is, is kind of talk about three things. Um, one of them is a little bit who I am in my career journey just of a point of interest and reference for all of you because, you know, if you want to develop yourselves into an innovative leader in any type of activity, you're going to have to go through a bit of a journey to get there. The second I want to talk a little bit about the company I run, Novellus, and this is really about, from my point of view, uh, at a capstone level, what makes Novellus cool and why? And what really is the cool thing about changing the minds of people regarding a sustainable business. And it really is a powerful, powerful engine for innovative thinking and allows you to take a leadership agenda. And the last thing I, I always do is just give you some of my advice on, on how to hold yourself accountable in your own career and some things to think about. And we'll talk a little bit about Q&A after that. How does, who, where do I point this? doesn't work. Oh, do I turn it on? Oh, yeah, that works. Um, I just covered this. I'll come back to it in a minute. But first, my career. Um, the Mighty Hokies will play Georgia Tech next weekend. <laughs> you know, the Hokies played Alabama in their first game. Who'd you guys play? What was that, what was that school's name? Elon. Oh. Boy, talk about mercy killings. <laughs> that was questionable. But anyway, I went to Virginia Tech, and I got an undergrad degree in engineering. And you know, you always pick your curriculum. I don't know how you do it. Mine was quite simple. My dad said, you will get out in four years, you will get an engineering degree, and you'll get a job, and you're going to get off the payroll. And that's about how it went. We had six kids in our family. He was a professor, and he was really interested in reducing his cash outflow to me. And I kid you not. Uh, I went back after a couple of years of work, and I got an MBA. And what I really decided in many regards, and the one reason I went back to get an MBA was quite simple, is while I loved engineering, and I loved the way it challenged me intellectually, I realized in the broader scope of things, I'm going to have to balance that with some broader business acumen. I made a simple choice on getting into business schools. I bought the school the book on how to get into the top 10 schools, applied to Michigan first, got in, and just stopped and said, I'm going to go to Michigan. It was a great experience. And uh, for those of you who are in business school, enjoy it. For those of you who think about it, think about it. It really is a phenomenal thing to do. And as my career went on, as was mentioned, I was, offered, I was awarded a doctorate of engineering uh, in 2003 for the extensive contributions I made to the global automotive industry really from a product and process point of view. And, and that, to me, was a very, very nice thing to be awarded. But I think career-wise, when I think back on it, all three of these events have played a significant role in the way I think about the business I run today. But a career journey, and I thought I'd talk a little bit about this for you to think about, because there's no one straight line on your career. And it really is up to you to decide where your career goes and how you do it. As I look back at my career, and I got out of engineering school, I had no idea really what I wanted to do, other than I didn't want to design nuts and bolts for GM. I knew that at the core of my bones, and I, I later went on and almost did that. But I, I decided, you know, at the time I got out, it was 1982, and it was just coming out of a downturn in the economy, that I'd go work for a stalwart, you know, blue chip company called Eastman Kodak. And when I got assigned to Eastman Kodak, I thought I'd be in Rochester, New York. It turned out I got assigned to Kingsport, Tennessee, to their chemicals division. Who knows where Kingsport is? Do you? What a dump. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> I showed up in Kingsport and almost shot myself in the head. And said, Honestly, the guy, I said, what am I doing here? There's, more, there's a church on every corner. There's a package store on every other corner. The number one 
product that people drive as a pickup, pickup truck with a gun rack. And I knew I was out of place the first day I'm in there. And one of the secretaries who was there turns around with a spit jar. How you doing? <laughs> and I thought to myself, I'm not, I'm going to blow up. But I made the most of it. And, you know, I was in the chemicals division. I thought, okay, I'll do the best I can. And that's one of the things you learn is you're going to be in situations in your career you just don't want to be in. But you have to engineer your way through that, and you have to make sure you optimize the time you're in there because ultimately, time is your most critical and valuable resource. But after about six months, I realized I cannot function in this city. And that was lesson number one. Don't go to an area you don't want to be in because living there can be just absolute hell. And I decided that I was going to go to LA. My brother was in LA at the time on MTV. There was Randy Newman with I Love LA. And I said, I'm going to LA. And I got a job uh, working for a company that was $50 million in sales. And it was called More Products Company. And that company was just getting into digital control systems. And this was a time when still, if you went into a big process plant, most everything was pneumatic, you know, air driven, air pressure control. And they were just coming out with single loop digital control systems with 8 bit, 16 bit, and 32 bit processors. It really, to me, was a time of cutting edge change at the beginnings of distributed control. And I was really enthralled about that because it was a creative spark and you could really see some things changing out there. Uh, albeit, you didn't quite understand where they were going. But the other thing I realized is I liked being in a smaller company. I learned more about business in the year and a half I was there than I think in most of the time up until I was 30 at my time at Ford. Because you did everything. I cleaned the carpets on Sunday night when I had a customer presentation on Monday. I went out and I had to make my own travel reservations. I made my own presentation materials. I, actually made all of the different logistical arrangements to handle all the project management for all the completed sales that I had. And I learned a lot about running a business from a re regional branch office. And I learned a lot about what it takes to grow a business. Both of those were very invaluable to me. But ultimately, I decided I have to go back and get my MBA. And after three years out, I went back and got my MBA. And at age 25, I thought, man, I'm getting old. I got to get through this. And I looked. <laughs> I honestly did think that. I look back on it now, at 25, I was just a pop. And, but what I got out of that, and I went to business school, I didn't go to business school for grades. I did the grade thing in undergrad, all right? I did fine there. Those grades got me into a top 10 program. I went there to learn. And I didn't care if I got Bs, B pluses, A minus, it didn't matter to me. What mattered to me was I took the time I was there to learn as much as I could learn. And if I came out of there in the middle of the pack of the class, great. And you know, I came out in the top third. I thought, fantastic. But what I got out was I learned about so many different businesses, so many different avenues, so many different aspects of what you can do. It really became kind of a mess when I had to think through what to do when I left. But I realized one important thing, that I wanted to create value. I wanted to drive change through the products I made in a positive way to help improve society globally or to help make the company more competitive or the company, country more competitive. And that's what led me to Ford Motor Company. And when I started business school, I was going to go be an investment banker. I was going to go be a consultant. I was going to make a ton of money, retire when I'm 40, sail on my sailboat, be done. And when I left business school, I left a lot more grounded thinking, I really want to know how to create value. And I want to apply my degrees. And I recognize I don't have the money to start my own company. So I'm going to go learn how to do this at Ford Motor Company. And that's a daunting task. Because you start out in this thing, and you're just going, where do I go from here? Well, I went from there, and I became, you know, of all things, a design engineer. So here I am with this MBA, this BSME, going into a job that when I graduated undergrad, thought it was the last thing I wanted to do. But interestingly enough, after three months of being with Ford in the high product planning area with all the other MBAs they had hired, I realized all I'm doing is spreadsheets. I'm making Excel spreadsheets. I'm polishing it for one week. I'm reviewing it with my supervisor. We polish it again. We review it with the director. We polish it again, and we do that for a month. And then it goes nowhere, or it goes just a little bit to change one little decision. And I thought, I'm not moving anything here. So I asked if I could go to engineering. 
And along the way, I asked if I could go and have a one-year training program. And they acquiesced. They were a bit surprised. But I said, look, I want to go, I want to go work on the line. I want to go learn how the product is made. I want to go learn how product is bought. I want to work in purchasing. I want to learn how product is designed. And I want to learn how product is actually cost managed. So I went around the company for a year and worked in purchasing, manufacturing. I did work on the line, um, engineering, and then finance. Best year of my life because I saw how a big company runs in a very consolidated window. From there, I developed a path forward that I developed. And I decided, look, within this big company, there are certain hierarchical things that I want to achieve here. But most importantly, I want to make a contribution at an early age. And I want to run something big at an early age. And through a couple of years, I developed a process working with a number of people where I got the skills to be qualified to be a chief engineer. At age 34, I was appointed to be a chief engineer for a billion four program. All of a sudden, I had 700 people reporting to me. Most of them were 20 years older than me. And I thought, if I survive this, I'm good. And you know what? I was right. I did survive, and I was good. But then I went on to the next plateau and said, all right, now I need to become a global executive. I can't sit here in the United States and kid myself that I know what it really is like to be a true global executive. So I went out and I saw it and I pursued a position in Europe. And I was be awarded the uh, point of the chief engineer for Ford of Europe. And I had 2,200 people. I was responsible for all of the vehicle and chassis engineering, all of the test uh, uh, proving grounds and test operations there. And it was a great job. And what I really got out of there, living there with my family, was I learned what it was like to live in Germany. And I learned what it was like to live in a different society. And I learned what it was like to relearn German, which I had, was taught at a very early age by my father. And I learned what it was like to be humbled, that you don't know everything. And that, frankly, if you're not sensitive to the other aspects of the societal cultural norms, which you don't know, and you're not humble enough to ask why, uh, you can actually put yourself in an awkward position. When that was basically wrapping up, I was set to go and become president of Ford of Australia. Couldn't wait for it. But about three days before I was supposed to go, I got asked if I would go and become the global research and, dire research and director executive at Mazda Motor Company. Ford had a controlling interest there. And I thought to myself, Japan, Hiroshima, no way. I am not going. They came back again and said, no, we really think you're the right guy. We're going to send a new team in there. We need to restructure. And I said, no, I'm just not going. And finally, they came back again. And they said, really, you really should go. And I said, NFW, I am not going. <laughs> and I didn't abbreviate it. And I thought to myself, I'm done with this. I'm not, I'm not going. And then I got a call from the president saying, look, here's why you need to go. And I'm sitting there going, how do I tell this guy no? And so I said yes. <laughs> so I was a bit of a wimp on that. And I remember I went home that night, and I go, now how do I tell my wife this? So I pulled her in. We had low music, bottle of wine. <laughs> she said no. <laughs> but we went to Japan. And that was phenomenal. I walked into this thing in Japan. I had no idea what I was going to walk into other than I was going to be one of the top three executives in a $22 billion company. Hey, I'm cool with that. But I walk into this, and I go, holy cow. As I looked at it, they were almost out of money. And then all of a sudden, I knew why they wanted me to go. Because I had developed a track record of working through difficult situations and taking on tasks <clears throat> that most people would be intimidated by. And maybe because I was naive, maybe because I had some brains or whatever, or maybe I just had the guts to jump in and do it, I felt that, OK, there's a reason they wanted me here. Let's go fix this thing. Three years later, I left there. And a year later, Mazda had record profits. They had record product launches. They had a new company. And I was part of doing that. And I look back on this to this day. And there are defining moments when you can actually say, that was a stunning accomplishment. And for the executive team there, which I was part of, it was a stunning accomplishment to take a near-death situation and then make it a very viable entity. I came back to Ford and was um, appointed to be the executive officer of 
global product development. I was 42 years old. I remember sitting. I'm now a member of the executive committee at Ford. And I'm going to myself, this is it. This is it. I've made it. I am a top executive, the number seven or eight executive in this huge $200 billion company. And I thought to myself, I hate this. I hate every minute of it. I hate it to my bones because I was so far removed from change. I was so far removed from the product development aspects, so far removed from an innovative approach. And I was mired in a bureaucratic situation that was a political rat nest that was going to die. And I said, I've got to get out of here. I don't want to do this. And at that point, that's a tough nut. Because you've got to figure out then, how do I extract myself from this and go to what I want? And what I wanted to do was run a company like Novellus. And I thought, OK, I've got to go from here to there. I've done that before. I left, no I left Ford. It was, um, you can Google it. it they, they thought, they, they went out to the press. We fired him. This was not any good. You know, it was, it was a bloody battle. And I resigned. And I just left. And they asked me why. I said, because this is not what I want to do with my life. And the most valuable thing to me is my time. And I remember talking with Bill Ford. He couldn't understand that. He's like, whoa. I've never heard anybody say that. You could have been CEO. And I said, I will be CEO, but not of this company. I don't want to run this company. And that's a pretty heady thing to come to, but that's how I felt. And that led me to Novellus. I didn't come here directly. I had to go out and get some more skills. I went out and ran a $5 billion spin out. I became CEO. We put in a board. We put in a capital structure. I learned how to run a business. I learned all of the things that I couldn't get out of the job I was in. And I took the risk that I would end up in a position like I'm in right now. And sometimes you've got to take the risk. And you've got to be confident in it. So that led me to Novellus. <coughs> Novellus is a very cool company. And the reason I, I ended up at Novellus, and let me talk about Novellus for a moment. Is when I was sitting there, and I was sitting there in Detroit, and I was going to myself, okay, what do I want to do now? After the Lehman Brothers debacle, I realized Detroit is going to change dramatically, and it's going to be ugly. And I got a call from a recruiter saying, would you be interested in taking this large spin out and leading it? And I looked at it, and I thought to myself, oh, wow, fantastic hardware, great assets, well positioned. Lousy business results, junk bond results. The difference between the two, the software, the management system, has got to be fixed. I can, it's easier to reboot a software problem than it is to reconfigure a hardware problem. I said, let's work with that. A great ownership structure, stability in the shareholder, a board that was supportive of change, a need to do something different, and a need to take the spin out and create a company from it. And when I thought to myself, this is an opportunity, I also thought, this is what I want. I want to lead a company that fundamentally we can drive forward and create, shape, and lead and become something great. So four and a half years ago, I started this company. It was a mess. We just lost a billion eight dollars. They were on life support from a cash point of view. They had no management structure to speak of. They couldn't even close the books. This is a $10 billion company, they can't close the books. They had just gone through what's called a restatement process because they had not recorded their, or accounted for the results properly. And I thought to myself, what a great place to start. You know, I've been here. I've been here at Mazda. We're going to find our way forward. But what we went after was not just being a company that survived. That was too low of a bar. I went after developing this company to be a visionary company that's leading the shaped agenda or shaping the agenda going forward around a sustainable business model that will drive the thinking of how to look at businesses beyond 2020. And I remember saying that to the executives when I started, and they thought, you are just a nut job. But I, they realized there was a kernel of truth in there and that if we could get there, it would be a really cool place to be. So we went at this thing by looking at where we were going to play, why, who we were going to partner with, and why, what we were going to do, 
and more importantly, what we were not going to do, and then how we were going to make this all happen by organizing differently. And it takes time. And when I started, Novellus was the world's leading producer of beverage cans. That was it. That was the business, it was aluminum beverage cans. They had made about $450 million of EBITDA. That's a measure of operating performance. But really, they were running a negative cash flow business. The first year I was there, we went out and cut and shaved and pared and pruned and shaped up the company. And yes, I did bring in an outside consulting firm because there was no strategy group to help us. And we went from 450 to 760. The second year, we continued that path, but we started to work with the board, and we went from 760 to about 1.1 billion. Then I went to the capital markets with a story that says, we're going to be number one in auto, number one in can, the world's leading recycler, and we are going to bank our future on having 80% recycled content in all of our products by 2020. You know, and I went, I'm out there pitching this to the rating agencies. I'm on road shows talking to investment analysts to, to get $5 billion of capital so that we could grow the company. And they're looking at me like, well, you know, we kind of believe the can story. We're not sure about this auto thought. Recycling, who cares? 80%, you're crazy. But then as we started to get into it, they began to realize if we were to get there, we would be uniquely positioned versus everyone else. And we would set the agenda within the industry sectors that we play. We got the money. We have $4.5 billion of money, actually 4.7. We paid the shareholder back one point, a dividend of $1.7 billion. And then we went on to invest over the last two years a little over $2 billion in, in, in complete modernization of many of our facilities, increasing the capacity of the company by about 33%. But most importantly, in those two years, we became number one in auto, number one in can. We are now the absolute leader in recycling globally for aluminum. And we lead in specific segments in what we call specialty within regions where it makes sense. We weren't there two years ago. We are there today. Now, we are setting the thought agenda around sustainability within the sectors we play. We are the showcase example of how a company can take sustainability to the core of its business and drive a profitable equation. And when you think about where we're headed, we put a global research and technology center into Kennesaw. It's just about 20 miles from here. It's a state-of-the-art, world-class facility. It's centered on those platforms. We have a world-class molten metal process group, which allows us to investigate how to take in different methods of scrap and actually melt them to actually extract out the impurities and then make pure aluminum. And through all of this, what's been fantastic for me to see is the resonance that this has had inside the company and the challenge it has created for our competitors, our customers, our end users, and the different types of partners that we're looking at now versus a few years ago. We just got invited to a very exclusive group that goes to seek or represent um, sustainable partners at Walmart. Never been invited. Never have they ever invited a company like ours. But the agenda is clear, and that's why we're going. And I've been asked to join the Clinton Global Initiative and now start to sponsor a platform around global sustainability. Our competitors are going, what happened? These guys are redefining the product structure. And through the process innovations we've made, we've introduced a product called Evercan, which is a closed loop material made of 100, up to 100% recycled material. And we met with Jag Land Rover, and we supply all the aluminum to Jaguar Land Rover. They want to make what's called Evercar, a all aluminum body structure made of 100% recycled content. And what you see now is the manifestation of different ideas and thinking as a result of what we put in place. That's what's cool about it. And it is cool. And it's a very keen thing, a very cool thing to work on every day because it's so right for the business and it's so right for society. So whatever company you think about, get one that's got a vision for 2020 and beyond that makes sense. Because ultimately, that's what's going to drive the future of these businesses. It isn't going to be the PowerPoint stuff or this or that. 
it's going to be a path forward that transcends what society's needs are and delivers to them thoughts and ideas and concepts beyond what they're capable of thinking today. Honestly, that's what Apple did. And honestly, that's what some other companies that we're working with right now are doing. And it's fantastic to partner with them. It is really cool. So that's a little bit of novellas. Let's talk about your career. And I'll close up with this and we'll have some Q&A. The first thing that I, I would strongly suggest you spend time with is just to answer the simple question. Are you an advisor or are you a creator? I'm a, I'm, I'm a creator. I'm a product guy. That's what I do. That's what I like. That's where it just excites me. I'm not an advisor. I'm not a consultant. I'm not an accounting guy. I'm not someone who wants to come up to you and give you your, in an advisory capacity. Here's what do we do. But there are people who do that well. And there's a divide in, in your path where you have to decide what you want. There's nothing more disappointing for me to see a 30-year-old MBA who's been a consultant with, and I'm not going to name a name, but one of the big consulting companies, and say, you know what? I'm tired of advising. I really always wanted to work on product. That's a decision they should have made when they're 18, 19, or 20. But they went down a path that allowed them to get there, and now they have to reinvent themselves at that point in time. Seize the opportunity you have. Just decide. Are you going to create value, or are you going to advise those who create value? It's a pretty simple decision. A couple of things that you have to recognize early on in your career, and I did this uh, just out of necessity when I got to Kingsport, is I realized I'm responsible for my career. Not the career planning group, not my boss, not the HR department, you know, not the, you know, the people who are giving me, you know, be patient, do this, do that. I'm responsible. And I've got to go out and recognize that, in reality, company men and days are over. Because companies morph and change so much, so fast now, that I better understand that I better have a pretty good career plot. And my, my career path is not atypical. But most importantly, you are your own business. It's me incorporated. It's who you are, what develops, how you think about yourself. So think about that as you set yourself up with your own 401k, your own financial planning, how you think about how you're going to manage your own money. And a lot of that will help you in terms of security as you transition and move forward. But most importantly, you develop your own advisory team. You know, a lot of people used to say to me, you've got to get your own advisory team. And I'd be like, how the hell do I do that? But I do have an advisory team now. And over 30 years, I've maintained contact with people that I trust, that will give me honest feedback, that I can call with a question. What do you think about this? Should I join this board? Should I do this? How do you handle thoughts about this? And that's extraordinarily valuable. It's not a group I meet with. But there are five or six people who I can call and who can call me, who I've been with between two and 20 years, who I know will tell me the truth. And they know me well enough to know, yeah, or yeah. And that's very important. I think you have to have your own personal agenda. A lot of this is, is not about what the company offers you, but it's what you bring to the company. Because what you bring to the company is going to define your career path. If you go into a company thinking, well, they got a great training program, that's a good thought. It's a good thought. But if you get out of that training program and you haven't taken advantage of it, that's a bad outcome. If you, if you max out on that training program and you learn as much as you can, and you perform and you take the time to absorb, you're going to set yourself on a trajectory that will get you to where you want to go. And everybody has their own career trajectory. Some are steep, some are shallow. And it's where your comfort zone is. But I've always found that the three Ps in my life always hold, hold water. If you perform, and you've got to perform beyond expectations, your own expectations should be the highest, to a point where you can say, there are no excuses. There are no buts. I've hit every objective, and I'm ready for that. If you've displayed the interpersonal skills, the ability to work with others, and to do that collaboratively, and not be a taker all the time, but be a giver and a taker and a true team player, you're going to go far if you hit those two. Because the third is your potential. And if you have the potential, it's only going to be a function of the first two. It's an f of x of how you performed and how you're seen to be as a teammate. It's that simple. 
I do personnel reviews all the time, all the time. And to me, it's always an f of x of those two. If there's a but, you got to clarify that but. If there's a well, you got to clarify that. But those that come in and say, she nailed it, great person to work with, really brings in positive energy into the room, yep, she's ready. Yep, let's promote her. Let's give her that next assignment. That's about how simple it goes for the ones that are a sure thing. That's where you want to be. Because then you can define your own career. You can say, I want to do this. Even if it's to the side or adjacent, they're going to go, wow, done great here, done great. Yep, let's do that. But the point of it is, it's your career. It's your path. You're in the charge here. Don't forget that. One of the last things I want to leave you with is, is career planning. Uh, career planning is very important. And you've got to have a bit of a, a pyramid approach to it because ultimately, as you grow older, your options go like this, all right? Because you're going to make a thousand decisions every year that kind of start to narrow down your trajectory, your platform, where you want to go. And I realized this early on. When I was uh, about 29 or 30, I met with a guy who I really respected. It was about his late 50s. And I asked him, I said, tell me about your career. And he told me about it. And I said, how did you end up here? And he said, I made a decision when I was 32 that the position I wanted in this company was this job. And then I tailored all of my experiences to get here. And he said, there was a risk I would never have gotten here. And I was willing to live with that. But there was also a reality that if I did things the way I thought they needed to be done, I'd get here. And he was the best at what he did in the company at the time. And he retired in a, in a very uh, positive way because he had made so many contributions. But what he had done is he had started out with his foundation. And he had said, this is where I want to go. He then went off and developed, and he gave me this triangle. And he developed then the general management skills to handle a broader array of complexities around the foundation. He then went out and he became global. And he was the guy who told me three continents. You got to live on them. You got to be with your family there. You got to spend at least five years out of the country, at least two, no, more, no less, in each region. And finally, finally, he became a senior executive at Ford Motor Company. I followed this my whole career. And I kind of said, your career foundation is your 20s. Developing the general management skills and doing all of that is your 30s. Becoming global is mid-30s to mid-40s. And then after that, it's up to you. I wanted to be CEO of a company like Pavelis. That was my goal. I got there when I was 48. And I've never, ever forgotten why I started my journey, why I ended up, and what I'm doing in this job now, and the opportunity I have to create a cool company. That's what I wanted to do. But you know, you're going to go through this. It'll be something different for you. But there is going to be a pyramid in your life where it goes like this. It's just a natural evolution of people's time and talent. Just a couple leadership essentials that I found work, work well, and then we'll end. Focus on what you need and how you do it. Focus is critical. There's too many people who don't focus. They talk the talk. They do the do. They walk the walk. But they're doing it for five different things at five, at all at the same time. Focus. Have a mental learning process. If you think you're going to walk out of here and stop learning, <laughs> forget it. You're just beginning. And if your brain turns off when you get that diploma, you're going to fall into the trap of being the 99 percentile of people out there that just go through life. If your brain turns on and you catapult yourself forward, you're going to be in that 1 percent. And that's where you need to go. You have to learn how to communicate. And you have to be consistent. What you say over here, you've got to say the same thing over here. And what you say the same thing over here. You've got to be completely consistent. And if you don't know, the best thing you can say, don't know. Can you help me? Who can help me with this? I don't know. And if you've made a mistake, be the first one to say, I did that. My mistake. Let's fix it. The worst thing you can do is say, I, I, I'm not sure who made that mistake. Let's go find out. Because you know what? Eventually, people will know it's you. And you see this in the press all the time, where people dodge the issue, and they get shot for it. Same thing happens in business. It's not any different. The most trustworthy people I have are those who come in and say, you know what? 
it didn't work right, Phil, and we, you know, we've got a problem here. Let's fix it. But they do it immediately as they know it, and then you go, let's go. Let's go fix that thing. We all make mistakes. I make mistakes like that. Project personal integrity and high moral character. This is very simple in business. Always tell the truth. Just, just tell the truth. Just, just tell it. It's that simple. If you always tell the truth, you sleep at night, you're not spinning, you're always honest with yourself, you're always the same person in every environment, and I can't tell you how easy it is to say it and how difficult it is to spin when you're under pressure. But just tell the truth. I've learned that when I was 14 and my dad pulled me in and said, did you drive the car today? Ah, absolutely not, Dad. Okay, did you drive the car today? Well, you know, I, you know, and then did you drive the car? Okay, guess what? If you would have told me yes the first time, you'd be getting your permit in three months. Because you took three cracks, it'll be nine months. I've never forgotten that. And I was pissed at myself. But he was very simple in it. If you just tell me the truth, I don't have a problem with it. I'll kick your ass, but we'll be done with it. <laughs> and to this day, I tell him that. And he goes, yeah. He goes, from that point on, you always told the truth. And uh, the last thing is most important is your career is just one part of your life. Make sure you have a balance. You know, it's very important. I have three kids, a wife that I've been with for 32 years. Everyone knows if my wife calls, I get up and take the call because that's my true boss for sure. <laughs> and everyone knows I take all my vacation and everyone knows I'm accessible there, but I will draw the line if I'm doing something with my family. And I have never, ever not put my family second. I have had many hours where I've worked long hours. I've been away from home, and my wife and I have worked on that. But when I'm home, I'm home. You know, if I'm going to get up and do email, I'm up at 5 in the morning, and I'm done. But always have your family in front of you. Your career will go, come and go. Your family is there for life. Just remember that. So the last thing I'll, I want to say is, it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's up to you. You guys are in the catbird seat. What you want to do is up to you. It was up to me. I took advantage of it. It wasn't easy. It goes like this. There's some really hard things you have to deal with, but there's some really cool things that you get to deal with along the way also. And there's life experiences out there that are just mind-blowing. And you just got to go grab them. But be aggressive. Learn from your failures. You're going to make them. I've made a lot of them. And they're just going to happen. It's impossible to have a 30-plus 30, 30 year career blemish free. Nobody has that. But if you have a failure, tell the truth, admit it to yourself, move forward, pick up your pieces and go ahead and recognize that that's, that's something you have to deal with. And just go forward. And you'll be better for it. But at the end of the day, performance is the great differentiator. I listen to ESPN radio a lot, and they're talking about coaches. I'm talking about Andy Reid this morning. Andy Reid, by all and large, is one of the most accomplished NFL coaches out there. But they're comparing him to Tom Coughlin. Arguably, Andy's got a better track record. But the thing is, is Tom has got two Super Bowls. The great differentiator is performance, bottom line. You know, The debate about the Manning brothers, Eli's got two. Peyton's got one. It's life. But performance is it at the end of the day. It's the same in business, the same in business as it is in sports. How you do it, how you perform, how you work well with people um, are all very important. So that's a bit of my journey, a bit of what I've been through. Um, it's exciting. It's a cool time for all of you. But do something you're really cool about, you're really interested about, and that's really cool. So I'm there. If you want to have any Q&A, that would be great. Um, I'll leave it at that. I, I love this when I do this at my company because everyone starts looking at their shoes. Yeah. Actually, I'll start off a question. Um, <laughs> and that relates to something you were saying just a few minutes ago about um, sort of focus on me, Inc., uh, having your own um, agenda, kind of promoting your personal brand, but also talking at the same time about the, the uh, importance of teamwork. And I'm just wondering how do you reconcile 
but two, because you may have to do sacrifice, personal sacrifices to be an effective team member. So, I, I think the two are easily easy to reconcile because what you have to look at is your own career is your responsibility, and you have to run that like a business. You have to have an appropriate financial plan for your retirement because there is no defined benefit plan. It's everything that you save in your 401k. You got to be responsible on how you manage your own debt. Don't spend a lot of money on credit cards. It'll kill you. But you also have to have a point of view on what's right for you and what's not. And you, you got to guide yourself into positions that you want to be in. And you have to have a perspective on where you want your career to go and at what pace you want it to go. That's what I mean about me incorporated. And recognize that the days when you, if you were sitting here in the 1950s, you'd be looking to start with a company and you're going to retire from that company. There's just too much fragmented fluidity in the corporate structure going around and there's too many cool things to do to lock yourself into that mindset today and it just doesn't exist. But when you're engaged in the organization you're with, be all in. Put that over here, that's your private agenda. When you're engaged, be the best you can in that situation for what it's called there. And you gotta learn how to just bifurcate that. It's sometimes difficult because you may not be right where you want to be and you want to look around and there might be things you have to think about. But learn how to compartmentalize that and learn how to focus on the task at hand. There's time at home when you're private and you can look at your me incorporated stature and do it. I do it all the time. I mean, I have my own 401k, my own retirement, my own career counseling. Um, and you know, I've developed that over a long period of time. But I, I adopted this when I got out of business school. I realized this is up to me now, and I've got to charter this ship myself. So <clears throat> going back in your story to when you uh, took over Novellus and you sort of took over a monodispersed company, yeah. it seemed, and you decided that innovations needed to be performed in order to drive the company forward, how as a leader do you determine uh, if an innovation is a worthwhile endeavor to go after? And not only that, if your company is well positioned with people and structure to go after that innovation if That's it will be good for question. you? That's a great question. It's not an analytical exercise, believe it or not. You have to be able to kind of put your radar out there and bring in trends you see, bring in societal demands, bring in competitive pressures, bring in capabilities of the company, kind of envision where these trends and capabilities can go and then start to slowly coalesce people around you that have that similar thinking. And ultimately, you have to make the call. And you have to start in a, in a step process. It's not the Big Bang Theory. That doesn't quite get there. And you know, it's funny, I'm just reading this Apple book and he didn't have the Big Bang Theory. He started with the iPod and he slowly worked his way up and I'm, that's where I'm at in the book anyway. But, what, what, I, what, I saw, what I saw at Novellus was incredible competency around rolling aluminum. What I also saw was a reality check that aluminum is an infinitely recyclable material. And what I knew from my days at Ford was that the issues of climate change are far more real and dramatic as we go forward than we could think. So you know, you pool that all together. And I had spent so many years traveling abroad and I had lived in Asia, I would lived in Europe, and I could see that there was this general geopolitical move towards closed loop. Closed loop recycling, closed loop manufacturing, reduction in energy and waste and the like. And I started to think, how can we play? Because we're going to have to play here. This is where everyone's going to have to play. And I had an executive committee discussion. I said, you know, we recycle really well. And everyone's going, yeah, we're really good at that. We're about 33%. And I said, where should we be by the end of the decade? And the executive committee said, wow, you know, why are we even worried about that? You know, it doesn't really do much for us. And I said, well, what, where are we, what, what theoretically could we do? Well, maybe 60%. And I said, okay, what, what have we thought about 70%? Well, you know, and there's this whining back and forth. I said, we're going to go to 80%. And they're like, we'll never do that. I said, that's why we're going to go to 80%. And that's exactly how it happened. And it was me saying, let's put a dagger out there and go get it. Let's go climb that mountain. Who knows how we'll get there, but we'll get there. And they were all, you know, that's, yeah, he's Phil, he's just, it's not going to happen. And a month later, I went to our board and I said, you know, I'm thinking about saying that we're going to go to 80% recycled content by the end of the 
decade. Oh, that sounds great, Phil. You know, let's move on to the next subject. That's all I wanted. Two weeks later, I went public with it. I gave it as a keynote speaker at the Aluminum Manu Manufacturing's Global Summit. You know, 400 people out there, all of the aluminum industry. And I said, we are declaring today we're going to 80% recycled content by the end of the decade. It was like silence. Are you crazy? It was exactly what I wanted. You know what? That was two and a half years ago. Now we are setting the agenda. Now we have Evercan. Now we're going to do Evercar. Now we're the world's leading recycling agenda. Now the entire company is just enthralled behind it because it's a winning strategy. That's how it starts. But you've got to have the guts to do it. You don't have the guts, don't do it. Because I went back a year ago, and I was invited back to give the next speech. So I went back, and there in the front row are my key competitors, and there are the key customers, and you know they're all pissed at me. You're taking all the aluminum. You're, this is bad for the industry. And they're saying this to me. And I'm just looking at going, bring it on, baby. <laughs> this is wonderful. And now they're going, you are for real. This morning, I was chit-chatting with the CEO of Alcoa. And he's like, will you back off? Said, no, we're done. We're gone. But that's how it is. You've got to have the guts to do it. And you know what? I could have been wrong. So what? I tried. But I knew I was more right than wrong, and that's good enough for me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, throughout your career, you seem to have set a lot of audacious goals and visions for yourself. Have yeah. you found that there's any common way that you've been able to achieve these visions and goals? You know, early on, um, and I think and it's interesting. If you want to look at another list of things, um, you go to the New York Times and Google the corner office. And this guy, Adam Bryant, he just interviewed me, which was really cool. Um, he um, has his five leadership things that he's distilled. That's a really good list. I just uh, somehow came across me today. But the number one thing you got to have is confidence. If you don't have confidence, don't do what I'm doing. Because it takes guts, it takes risk. You've got to put yourself out there. It's a high risk reward ratio. It's not a low risk reward ratio. But what I realized was, like any professional athlete, and I, and I love sports, is you, if you don't push yourself, if you don't push your body and your mind to levels that you don't think you can achieve, you're never going to get there. You're going to be working within a defined comfort zone. And intellectually, you're all exceptionally bright people. But the difference between me and my Harvard classmates was my guts, my confidence, and the push. And it wasn't a push to work the extra hour in a day. It was the push to think bigger, to push myself into those situations, and to take the risk, and to live an uncomfortable risk profile. That's what defines it. There were so many times I could have failed. There's a number of them I did. But if you have that, you'll, you'll be fine. It never goes away. So you either have it today or you don't. That's about what the, the story is. Yeah. Uh, in yesterday's Wall Street Journal, there was a picture in a short article about Alcoa. Alcoa, Tennessee? Yes. Yeah, I read that. And, and the downside and everything. Yep. Alcoa had been delisted from the Dow. Yep. What is the difference between Novellus and Alcoa? Why are you successful and they are not? And also, how did the name Novellus come about? Yeah, OK. Great. Let me answer the first, and I'll get to the second. Or answer the second, I'll get to the first. Novellus came out of, it was a spin-off from Alcan in 2005. And the word Novellus came out of, if I get it right, innovation, velocity, and speed combined. So no for innovation, vel for velocity, and s for speed. So it was innovation, velocity, and speed was the kernel behind the name Novellus. And I didn't know that you know, until I, I started. I mean, it was a name I'd never really heard of. But, you know, we're, we're now a globally recognized in the sectors we play in name. And I think it's turned out to be the right name for the company, you know, interestingly enough. Because they had an idea that they could be more nimble, more flexible, more aggressive. Uh, they had the assets to do it. And they had a desire to be an innovative company. Uh, easy to say, hard to do. Alcoa. Um, I, 
no, re no recording here, right? Yeah, what? Except for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're done with that discussion. No, I, look, I can only give you my honest answer, and I'm only going to give you my honest answer. Alcoa, to me, is a company that has no strategy. I don't know what Alcoa stands for. I don't know how to think about Alcoa as an integrated aluminum manufacturer. I don't know where they're going. I don't know why they're making the decisions they're making. I do not understand for the life of me what they're doing in Saudi Arabia, which is their big cornerstone project, which as I meet Alcoa executives can't stand. They think it's the biggest waste of time they've ever done. They have no ability to take a strategic agenda because their leadership isn't gutsy enough to make the changes that they need to. It's that simple. That's my personal view. I know, I know a number of them. I know how they, how they think a little bit, you know, Scotia. But we hire enough Alcoa executives to know that what I'm saying is more accurate. And a, the soft word is they've lost their way. How they've lost their way? Look, they got a German running them. He's, this is the aluminum company of America. He's in New York. The operations are in Pittsburgh. Why? That is a huge disconnect that says we're a corporate center. You're over here, but yet we're a coal from Pittsburgh. Why, why do you do that? The second thing is they're not Siemens. And Siemens is a portfolio company. The guy who's running them is a portfolio manager. So he may, he's a great guy, by the way. He really is. But when you look at his background, it's Germanic. It's portfolio, and it's really holding businesses at P&L centers when they're not holistically looking how they create value. If they had an American living in Pittsburgh that was an innovative driver, you'd have a different company. My opinion. Just look at Ford Motor Company. An American in Detroit driving innovation. Two out, three out there. <laughs> Yeah, so clearly um, confidence is important yeah. and also making some audacious decisions. Um, corollary being that failure may be inevitable. I was wondering if you could tell us the lesson learned from either your favorite failure or a spectacular failure. <laughs> You're assuming the two aren't the same. Um, I, I think there, to me, as I go back on it, one is a personal failure, and the other is a true professional failure. Um, let me talk about the professional failure first. When, when I left Ford, it was a very difficult process for me to go through. Here I am, 42, I'm an executive officer. Every time I went out to talk to somebody about the, my desire to leave the company, they just shut it down. They said, what are you talking about? Why would you want to do that? It doesn't make any sense in the world for you to think about that. You could run that company. And I would have to go through this process of explaining that's not what I want to do. And they would also shut it down because they realized that if they were to take me from Ford, a research company, they would just be blacklisted. And it would not be a good thing. So I slowly realized I'm going to have to leave myself. And I'm going to have to find a way to find an opportunity to transition out. And I'm going to go through a couple of skips before I catch. And can I live with that? The personal failure in that, and, I, and let me talk about that first, was I knew probably in my early 30s that I wanted to run a company not the size of Ford. And I probably knew when I was 35 that I should leave the company. I didn't because I was told that I was going to be the next VP of product development. I was told that you know, my career was being handled by the board of directors. I was told all of this, and it all happened. Because I did some really exceptional things for the company. And I ended up, seven years later, as an executive officer, the youngest in the company. And all of what they were doing happened. And it was recognized as the right thing to do in the company for, by everybody except me. And so my personal failure was, I wasn't true to myself at the, at the core. And I didn't, I didn't take the energy to leave when I should have. And so I had to leave in a much more difficult situation at a later age. So my professional failure is the first skip. I actually was sitting there going, well, how do I get out of here? And ultimately, 
um, Goldman Sachs, through an intermediary, came and said, look, we own all the debt on this company called Plastic Incorporated. Why don't you come and be the president and COO, and we're going to do a roll-up. We're going to go plastic, then we're going to buy the assets over here and the assets over here, and we're going to make about a $7 billion tier one inter interior trim supplier. And we want you to be the CEO. And we'll make this work because we control the debt. And all of that's true. So I, I, after a series of about a three months of negotiation, they literally bought me out of Ford. I went and started this company. And literally within a two weeks that I was there, I realized the entrepreneurial founder was, a, was nuts. And I mean seriously nuts. And I thought to myself, what have I gotten myself into? This is Kingsport times 100. And, and, I, and I had to really dig deep on that one. And I did the best I could. And within three weeks, three months, we had this, the entire transaction set up. It was four steps. This is the, I'll never forget this. The first step was she had to come in and sign a piece of paper. And by doing that, she would relinquish control of her company. She'd become a member of the board. But she would also get $352 million. I, I, I was like, wow, age 59, you have done some marvelous things with your career, uh, no matter how crazy you are. She sent me a note the night before, fantastic job. I'm going to get you a bottle of Petrus. You know, we're going to celebrate. And I'm like, OK, we're on our way. I made it through the first phase. Next morning, I wake up to an email. Can't do it. And I remember reading it, and I'm like, I can't believe it. I've never seen that. And then I realized I had completely misjudged her at levels that I should have seen that were so obvious. And I thought, wow, this is something I've never seen. $352 million to can't do it. And she ended up taking the company bankrupt, losing all of it. So I ended up, uh, two weeks later, getting contacted by Arvind Meritor. Would I come and run their automotive group? And we're going to spin that out. So I found a way out of that. But I realized at that moment, I somehow had misjudged her. Somehow I got suckered into this thing. And I should have been more patient. So I've learned a lot from that one. Hi. Hi. Yeah. And uh, also, in all of uh, this age of leaning in forward, backwards, and, and whatever, I'd really like your perspective on females who are in your position uh, and some who you really admire in terms yeah. of those who've been able to create that balance. Oh, that's a great question. You know, I mean, I think there's so many different ways to look at working, what makes a great company, a company great to work for. And I'm going to give you a, the unabridged version. And I believe in, in many regards it's an impossible task because there are just certain things that never quite work out for everybody. But most importantly, I believe in the no asshole rule. And I've worked for enough of them. I know what they look like. I know what they smell like. I don't like them. Um, when I see one, I get rid of them. Because at 45, if you're an asshole, you've always been an asshole. Get out. And if you have that kind of philosophy and you bring in a management team of just good quality people, and they are top performance, but their personalities are, and they're just good quality people, they're grounded in who they are, the organization becomes grounded. And it takes time. But you have to be able to have that core, because to do what we've done, you have enormous disruption. We've shut seven, 10 plants. I've had to lay off over two to 3,000 people. The second thing to me is, is this balance between high quality work and high quantity work. So you're always busy. So your mind is productive. You're usefully using the tools. And it's, it's an aligned manner so you can say, you know, I just joined today. I'm working on recycling. It's the top goal of the company. Or I'm working on auto. Or I'm working on the 100% recycle can. There's a line of sight towards the, the, the top goals of the business. So you feel you're contributing. And you're loaded. And we try to do that every day. The biggest challenge I have and the biggest thing we deal with is people are overloaded. When you go through this change cycle, 
people get overloaded and you got to balance that back. But it's a dynamic, organizations are, are amoebas. They're dynamic, they split apart, you got to bring them back together, you got to constantly remind people what you're doing. And we just had our Global Leadership Summit last week uh, with the top 160 people, now they're all cascading it out to their people. And we do that once a year, because they have to know. I have a quarterly call for all of the organization uh, as we announce our earnings. We have newsletters that go out every two weeks and communications internally is so critical. And, um, and people have to feel like this is the, the, where I'm on a winning team. It's a balance. It's hard to get all of that to work at one point in time. I think we've done a really good job there. I think we still have work to do. So, you had a question? Just now, question. All right. So you, uh, talked about how you think about opportunities. I wanted to ask you how you think about threats. Um, and two in particular that jumped to mind were BMW recently came out with an electric car yep. that is all carbon fiber. And then also there's been a huge increase in the number of aluminum production companies in China. Yep. Um, that's all primary uh, aluminum. But yep. so how do, you, how do you think about those things? Uh, good question. Um, first of all, what do you guys think of the Tesla? Cool car, huh? It's our aluminum. So we like it too. Um, carbon fiber is a unique play. It's a very esoteric. This is the I-8 at the Frankfurt Show. It's an esoteric material that's very difficult to fabricate in high volume applications. It allows you, though, some real flexibilities to form complicated shapes that aluminum or steel cannot. And the only way you can get there in some other materials is by casting it or forming it out of plastic. But it has real structural agility, real torsional and bending strength, and it's, it's a real product. Its serviceability characteristics are terrible because once you crack it, it's cracked, the entire piece has to be replaced, and that's a very complicated process for a carbon fiber body. It will always be in auto shows, and at a point in time, I question whether it will ever be in a mass production vehicle because it's just too slow of a cycling process to get there. Aluminum, by comparison, is not as light. It doesn't allow you to form that, but it is applic applicable to a high volume manufacturing system, and it's about a third the weight of steel. So from that point of view, I think all of these materials will always play, and I don't consider them a threat. I consider them a player in the field for an application that will always be there that's very specialized. If you look at the Dreamliner, when they tried to go to composites, that's the last composite plane Boeing will make because it's so rigid when they went to line up these big sections, right? They had to have exact alignment as they brought them together and they were more or less, when they went to line, they were just slightly off. You can't re-drill carbon fiber because you put a, fa a stress fracture into it. So they had to pull it apart and if it didn't fit, they had to scrap it. And that's what the big supply line issue was with Boeing. Okay, the fuel savings are probably real. But if you look at all of the major, major new product programs coming out of the aerospace, they're all aluminum. Because that experiment showed that theoretically it does work, but it's a difficult material to work with. But ultimately, I think all will play. The threat out of China is a very real issue. And um, it, it does manifest itself into the rolling process. There is far more rolling capacity coming out of China than we ever thought. And we put a huge expansion into our Korean operations. We have a greenfield site going into China. And what's happened is these sites, interestingly enough, we never properly gauged the capability of the Chinese manufacturing system to adapt to rolling aluminum, which is complicated, at the speeds that they have. And they operate with a different business model. They're a nonprofit orientation. They don't amortize the investment in there. And as long as they have one you know, RMB profit, they're cool, all right? And uh, that's a real threat. And their pricing uh, their discipline is crappy. They'll just go out and sell whatever they want. They gobble up the spot market, and it's, it's really shaking up that whole Asian spectrum. And that's a real issue for our company right now, and we have to deal with it. And, you know, we're going to have to become more competitive on pricing and take some profit off the table there and bring it back somewhere else. But it's, it's, a, it's, it's reality. You know, good question. Yeah. Um, actually, I had two, but I'll only ask. I won't ask the sustainability one. I'll ask the leadership lesson one. Yeah, sure. Um, 
you said you were reading about uh, Apple. Is, is it the Isaacson book on Jobs? Yeah, it's the, the Steve Jobs book. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like to hear your lens on Steve Jobs. I, I read that book, and I am just so ambivalent. I don't know. You know, I have a, like a love-hate relationship. He's toxic. I don't admire him. But the issue, you know, I sit here with my apple. Uh, you, you know, th th how do we get the appropriate leadership lessons from Steve Jobs? Uh, uh, um, I, you know, here's, here's, a, here's I, I think, my view from early on is Steve got incredibly lucky early in his career. How many, I don't know how old was he was, 23, 24, 25, when he made $250 million. That gave him the freedom to be a jerk in every sense of the word. He was a poor family man. He was a very, very poor partner. He was very acidic. Um, clearly, he was a brilliant man. If he did not have that $250 million that he could go back and play around with, he wouldn't nearly have been where he's at. Because what he had with that was the ability to fund his own future and the ability to basically say, F you, I'm going this way. And guess what? He did many times put his own checkbook on the table. And when you have that ability and you're willing to do that and you're not working for money, which he clearly wasn't, you can do what you want. And you know what? People actually, I think, were in awe of that. And as I look at that, I think what he became, and at, at a point in time, he actually became a pretty good businessman. And he, I like his tonality in the boardroom. He's also very tough. And he wasn't just a product um, czar, which he, he clearly had inspirational vision. Those around him created that. He, he drove the aesthetic development of it. Whether he was a software engineer or not, probably not. But who, could he describe what he wanted? Probably. But I, I think where I'm at right now in the book, I, I step back and say, well, he certainly was able to fund his future. He bought his way forward. Through that, he had the incredible ability to be a very tough negotiator. Because he didn't care if he got fired. His family was fine. He had hundreds of millions of dollars in the bank. Life was good. He wasn't working off of six-month severance, you know, where he had to get back to work. But I think he, he clearly defined and developed in a very true way um, a fully integrated system, which I admire. I have to admit I do admire that. And I, I am a Jobs fan. But um, I wish I had $250 million at 23. I, wouldn't, <laughs> I don't know what I would have done. And I, he made something of it. But he was able to fund his future, which I think gets missed in that whole book. Thanks. All right. Well, Phil, thanks for coming to Georgia Tech today. Sure. Thanks. <clears throat>